Good evening, everybody. I'm Joe Dara, Director of Alumni Relations, and this is the 100 Days uh, of Presidency for Dr. Jason Boyer's Zoom event. I'm joined tonight, uh, obviously, by Dr. Jason Boyer's and uh, Kristen Moran, Vice President of College Relations. And um, just a few uh, notes. Uh, again, so this is the 100 Days um, Zoom for, for Dr. Boyer's presidency. His 100th day officially was on September 8th. Uh, he began June 1st after joining us from Cleary University. I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Boyers. Kristen will be moderating questions. Um, there were some questions that were submitted in advance. Thank you. And we will also get to live questions as well. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, Dr. Boyers, the floor is yours. Thanks, Joe. So, so first of all, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, this is my third town hall today. Uh, and I think we've We've talked to um, uh, probably close to 100 people today in different different formats. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to try to to talk about some points, but um, Kristen and Joe are just going to have to be bored because they've heard uh, heard most of this before. Um, but but I really want to welcome everyone. 100 days has gone by quickly. Um, we've had a few things we've been working on, but. Uh, tonight we're going to do, as Joe said, we're going. I'm going to have some opening remarks. Um, I know some questions were submitted, and we're going to go through those. And then we're. I, I really want to open it up um, so that if you didn't have a chance to submit a question, but you do or would like to follow up, I want you to have a chance to do that. And we'll ask you to raise your hand or use the little icon that shows the hand raised um, on Zoom. But uh, we want to. I wanted this hundred days to be more than just about COVID. We've been talking a lot about COVID every day about COVID, um, but I don't want to ignore COVID. So a couple of things I wanted to talk about. Our systems uh, are really working uh, in a way that I'm, I'm very happy with, uh, considering the circumstance. We have a great partnership with Mainline Health, and quite honestly, that has been a, a lifesaver in providing guidance and, and also an opportunity for us to deepen uh, historic relationship and, and allow us as, as stakeholders in the community to work together. They have come in and obviously looked at everything, helped us social distance, uh, help us with testing. If we have a student that has a suspected um, case or symptoms, we call them and within two hours they pick up the sample. We're able to test those students right on site, um, which has been great. I want to say this, we've been fortunate so far, but uh, we're going to, uh, I can almost say with certainty that, that statistically, we're probably going to have some positive cases on campus. So I just want to prepare everybody for that. That's just by opening. We know that's probably the case. What I want to tell you is we have good procedures in place to safeguard the community. We understand what we need to do. We have, uh, we have spaces set aside to isolate. So uh, and I, I'm hopeful, too, in keeping everyone up to date. Uh, I've actually had a, a lot of good feedback from parents, uh, especially, and that they really are appreciating the Monday emails. And so, so I'm, I'm hoping you're enjoying those as well. Um, and we'll keep communicating in an open and transparent way about how things are going regarding COVID. But this is a time where we're getting hit, we're getting inundated with with messages from the media and it's very easy during COVID to, to think let's lean back, let's pause, let's wait. But as a small college in, in, in Rosemont College, um, our mission talks, uh, talks a lot about who we are and, and one of the great quotes that has consistently recycled in me um, from the founder of the society um, really was meeting the wants of the age. So I view this as an opportunity to lean forward and lean forward in this as an invitation to, to begin to move um, Rosemont in a way that, that really positions it for growth and sustainability going towards the future. Um, I have had a chance to talk to different groups across uh, the campus. Uh, Kristen told me earlier today, I think that um, not including this meeting with alums, I've talked to something like 395 alums in different groups, some in, in bigger groups, but some one-on-one. -on -one. I've had a chance to talk with faculty, staff, the adjunct faculty, 
um, and really, really try to delve into where they see Rosemont's opportunities are and where they see their challenges are and allowing them to speak freely uh, to help give me counsel, give me advice. And the one thing I can tell you is something you already know. We have a, we have a community that's very committed to, to Rosemont and very committed to making Rosemont the special place it has always been. Um, but we have some, we have some challenges too. And I want to position us in a way that we can focus on growth. The board hired me to focus on, on growing the college to, to help us live our mission in, in, in sometimes new ways that we hold true to our values, but, but find ways to extend the, the proposition that is a Rosemont education. That's what we intend to do. Um, I think that, that you're going to see themes throughout uh, this first year. You're going to see some changes, and that is normal in the process of, of, of transitions. I want to be able to build on the good work of, of those who came before me in this, in this seat, but also to, to help, us, um, help us take advantage of the opportunities that, that lie before us as we meet the wants of this age. And one of the things that you're going to see us focus on as well is, is the idea of diversity. Um, if any of you saw my Monday email, if you looked at our freshman class, we didn't have a majority of, of, of any background in our freshman class. I mean, that was something that, that brought joy to my heart. And we have a, a lot of our community, we have actually a majority of our community that is, is not um, white. Uh, it comes from different backgrounds and different locations. And so we want to embrace our diversity as a strength and you're going to see us do that. You're going to see us embrace what a Rosemont education can mean uh, in, in the corporate world in new ways. And uh, I think ultimately what you're going to see is, is us focus on uh, growth, um, focus on new ways to grow our education and including really leveraging the modality, the distance learning modality, which is kind of a big part of my background. Um, I'm excited to talk about, about all these things with you. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, the Board of Trustees has, you know, has supported um, kind of a vision of, of reinvigorating our mission and, and grow and leading to growth. Um, and one of the things that I think we have an advantage with is really leveraging our ability to, to highlight that an education is more than just a vocation, but it's about building a meaningful life. It's one of the things that attracted me to Rosemont from the very beginning. Uh, and one of the things that led me to, to want to be president here. And we have a special place. Uh, I get more energized every time I talk to our students. I get energized when I talk to our faculty. Um, and, uh, and I just want us to move forward and, and live as fully as we can the mission that has been set before us. So uh, that is my, my initial uh, uh, take here. And I, and I want to open it up to questions when we're, where we can have some real dialogue, but, but I'm grateful for the support that all of you have given me, um, the notes that come. Uh, I had a card today waiting on my office, in waiting in my office from a, an alum, and, and those things are, are, are so helpful to me during this time. Uh, so thank you. And uh, Kristen, I'm going to give it to you, and let's start the... Uh, uh, the questions for the president. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to see all of you. We appreciate your being here. So we have a number of submitted questions. You have all uh, done your homework well and uh, given us good things to ask Dr. Boyer. So the first question uh, was actually from um, an alum from the class of 64. And the question is, uh, what you've talked about um, really talking to the community, um, but what is the common thread that came up in those conversations these last you know, 100 days? I think there, there's, there's two common threads that, that, that kind of weave together a little bit. And I talk about a common thread a lot in that there's a thread that runs through everything we do. Um, and I think I mentioned in, in different alumni meetings that I'm a big follower of, of Richard Rohr in that how you do one thing is how you do everything. And so the, the, the first part I would say, uh, and this, this goes to our strength, is we do have a very committed community. 
that is, is student centric, really focused on our students and, and wanting to, to create that positive environment for students. And so with, with committed, uh, with that kind of commitment, I think you can do a lot. Um, I, there, there's also a common thread that we have to deal with, which is um, being a small liberal arts college. You know, we've had some struggles financially. And so there, there is, a, there is I, I think, to some, in some way, I would call it a, a, a sense of hesitancy. Uh, and, and I think fear may be, may be a strong word, but, but I think hesitancy is, is the right word. And that hesitancy has sometimes caused uh, a feeling that we won't have the resources to, to finish some things. And so that has led to me talking to the leadership team quite a bit about the importance of execution um, and of starting, starting things, finishing things and, and, and addressing things that, that we need to have addressed. And, and so um, I think there's, it's not good and bad, but there's, there's challenges that come along with, um, with how we move forward. And I'm gonna hold a, us to a standard um, that I think is important. We, we want to execute this. The, the students here who come here, uh, we have a lot of first generation students now, and I'm so thrilled by that. I was a first generation student. And, you know, I've, I've kind of passed that, that stage where, where quite honestly, it's, a, it's about um, title. I wasn't ever, I didn't grow up dreaming of being president of a college, to be honest. Um, I thought I'd be in youth be a youth minister in some, some small town, to be honest. Um, but, um, you know, it's not, it's not about title uh, as much as, as, as it is about creating space for, for these students and to thrive and for our faculty and staff to live out their career goals in a very meaningful way. And I think that's how we're gonna move forward. Thank you, that's great. The next question is actually from an anonymous alum and it, it builds off of your last question, which is in your mind, what has emerged as the college's greatest strength and its greatest weakness? I kind of just talked about that. I think the commitment is the greatest strength and I think um, a culture of hesitancy um, is probably our, our biggest weakness right now. And so honestly, when I've talked to groups, I've asked for uh, something I call suspension of disbelief. And a suspension of disbelief for me culturally is, is much like going to a movie. Um, and I, uh, my wife likes different kinds of movies than I do. Um, and, and I like a good summer blockbuster on occasion uh, that has a lot of things that, that may blow up. But when you go in, you have suspension of disbelief. You know that probably a normal human being can, can survive that explosion, but, but you just go with it and you eat your popcorn. Um, I think culturally, there's a suspension of disbelief. You have to, you have to have some faith that, that let's start some things, let's, let's address some things. Let's have some managerial courage to, to invest in some growth initiatives, um, knowing that, that they will work out and, uh, and being committed to making them work out. So I think that suspension of disbelief is something we've been talking a lot about uh, across the campus. And we have, we have some real excitement in the campus about, about what's possible going forward, even in the midst of COVID. And I would say COVID has been a part of it. We've been able to come together and do some, some new things already. Uh, and I'm excited about, about how the community is responding. There were several questions related to enrollment, um, but um, a member of the class of 65, I think, said it best, which was, what are the long-term plans for Rosemont in terms of the size and the makeup of the student body? I think that is a great question. So, so I, I'd like to talk about enrollment a little bit because I'm passionate about this subject. Um, a lot of small liberal arts colleges will, um, they'll look at enrollment and sometimes it becomes about you know, we just need to hire the right enrollment leader or we need to partner with this company or that company. Um, I think enrollment starts at a more basic level, which is being clear about the type of student that you can best serve. Uh, and one of the things I've been talking to the community about, and we're gonna have a more extensive conversation in October, is building avatars. And by avatars, I mean building kind of the profile of the students that we can best serve. And once you're very clear and you have that moment of clarity of these are the students, 
that should come here. The strategy to go out and talk to those students, understanding where to meet those students where they are and bring them into Rosemont, that becomes very clear. But if you're, if you're going out just to recruit the next class and you don't have an idea of what's distinct about the type of student you want to recruit, well, then, then it becomes more difficult. In fact, the, the, the bigger your net, really the smaller your opportunity. And so what you want to do is cast a very narrow net that says, these are the students that are going to best be served by coming to Rosemont. And let's go out and get those students. And let's, let's form our strategies around that. I think it really begins with being very clear about who we are and who we can best serve. Um, and that's the attitude that I brought to, to the previous institutions I've been involved in. And by, by starting with that core profile, being very clear about who we serve, so clear that you could ask any person on campus um, who is a Rosemont student, and they could tell you about that Rosemont student. When that happens, you will see enrollment growth. And I say that with confidence because I've seen it in my past institutions. And I'm not talking about little enrollment growth, but I think you can grow enrollment 20 to 30%. Um, many of you might know, or might not know, but we had a, we had a really great leader um, on our board in enrollment, a legend, really, in Bob Massa. And uh, I've recruited actually somebody who, uh, Bob, Bob left, his, his, he rotated off. I've recruited uh, another national enrollment leader that I think is kind of a young Bob Massa. And uh, he, uh, he and Bob actually know each other, but um, he's joining our board. We're, we're, I wanna bring talent to the board level. I wanna bring talent to, to what we're doing within the college. And I wanna bring talent here and retain talent. Um, but all those things will help us provide the strategies around enrollment growth. But no, no strategy will work unless you're clear about who you are and who you can best serve. And that's where we're gonna start with on enrollment. Great. And of course, related to enrollment is the financial health of the college. And um, a member of the class of 76 asked for an update on the financial state of Rosemont. So Rosemont was a small college and has had a few years of, of declining enrollment around their UC especially. Uh, the undergraduate college. And, and so there were some struggles financially um, over the last few years that were navigated through. Um, and those, those remain with us. Um, and COVID um, always makes it a challenge, but, but I will talk to you a little bit about what I see. Um, so I see an opportunity. We're working to restructure our debt. Um, our enrollment this fall has actually stayed pretty steady. Um, uh, with, with what, where we've been the last few years. I think overall our mix changed, but we stayed relatively flat even in the age of COVID, which was a good thing. Um, but I think there's, there's an opportunity there. Um, to put it in perspective and not to bore you with a bunch of numbers, we, you know, we brought in about, I think it ended up being something around 96 um, freshmen. And we brought in, from what I can tell over the last few years, um, around that 100 mark. And I believe where we really need to be is about 150 uh, to 200. And so that's the plan we're putting together so we can bring that in in, in fall 21, which will be my first fall uh, over enrollment. And so uh, to really be sustainable, that's where I'd like to see us get to. And I think the, an earlier part of the question was about what size we need to be at. Um, I'm a big believer that, that every college has a right size, that, that size where you have enough money because of enrollment and, and where the college is that you can invest back into the good ideas, invest back into taking care of your deferred maintenance. And uh, we're at about eight to 900 uh, students overall. I think we need to be uh, closer to 1,200 to, to be at that right size. So I really see us building a plan around getting us to, to 1,200. Uh, in the meantime, in the short, mid, and long term, we're going to have goals um, on where we're going to be financially. Um, but, but part of that is investing in growth initiatives as well and finding ways to do that. Um, and, and you have to. You can't cut your way out of a problem. Um, while you need to be fiscally responsible, um, the idea of, well, we don't have have money to invest here or there. I think it needs to be about priorities and you decide which priorities you're gonna to commit to 
and, and make those decisions. And so that's what we're going to do. Overall, the, with, with the finances of the college, I think we're, we're holding our own in the age of COVID. And right now we put, we've, be, we've begun putting a plan in place, I, I think, that will lead us forward. All, all the roads lead back to enrollment, though. And that's really going to be key for us over the next few years. Thank you. So there is a question um, about how the two terms, one focus um, uh, sessions have gone in this fall semester and how that hybrid style of instruction um, might impact the future. So we actually just did a big faculty survey on it and, and I, I, I basically wanted to make sure that, that we were checking in with students who started the semester online, those sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And so we did that, and that became actually an energizing exercise um, because it really connected our team with, with the students who may have not been on campus right away. The feedback we've got both on the faculty level and from the student level has been predominantly that they like the format. Uh, the students and the faculty like less classes each term, but they're still getting the same number of classes in. I think there's a couple subject matters where it becomes difficult. Um, I would say around the sciences and, and, um, um, and, and you know, uh, math subjects that, that maybe uh, we, need to, we need to look at. And I think there's going to be opportunities to, to have some classes that are 15 weeks, but I, while well, the decision is not final, Everything I'm hearing from the faculty uh, is that, that spring uh, is likely to be those two terms again, um, that, that they've liked the, the format enough uh, that, that it's likely to happen. We brought in extra resources in, a, in an outside group. I wanted to strengthen our instructional design. And again, online is something that's in my background. Um, and so, so we brought in extra help. We've workshopped every class. Every class is in our learning management system right now. Um, and that has been a positive, we've got positive feedback from that. And we're gonna continue to invest in, in what we do uh, in building our online uh, format. Because it, it, there is a way to engage and be, um, bring the power of small to the online modality. Um, and it just creates, it, it, it just means some more work. But, but what I found is our faculty is willing to do that. Um, and they're actually enjoying, I think, somewhat learning these new skills. Um, so I believe you'll see it in the spring semester. That decision is not final, but I believe you will see it. And then I think we have two semesters of data, which will decide what happens going forward. My, my gut says there'll be some innovations that have come from COVID that will, will carry forward and will make us stronger. And so I'm, I'm watching with great curiosity at how this all unfolds. So uh, a nice segue to a question from the class of 60, a member of the class of 66 is, uh, is there still an undergraduate core curriculum? So I, I think, yeah, yes. And, and I think the, the important part to understand is um, that I think it is both our liberal arts and, and um, our, our Catholic tradition and, and, and the, the, the religion part of that, uh, the relig religious education part of that, both of those things are unique and distinct about what happens at Rosemont. And I'm very committed to, to um, having that be a part of the student experience here. Um, I can tell you, I have not delved closely into the evaluations that are happening, but, but it's, a, it's a really great time to, to be having those conversations because we've got middle states accreditation coming up, um, which is our, our, you know, every, Every so many years, uh, we have our accreditation visit, um, and and we have a, we're going to begin a, a conversation around a new strategic plan. But one thing we will not navigate away from is I think what makes us distinctly Rosemont, and I think both the, both the 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 religious tradition that we come from and uh, the liberal arts make us distinctly Rosemont and, and inform how our graduates go out and build meaningful lives, and so that that will stay. Thank you. There were uh, several questions um, from various um, alumni on uh, the issue of diversity and equity on campus and the Black Lives Matter movement and how our campus will address those issues. Yes, so I am, um, one of the things I, when I came in and I've had conversations again across our campus and with, 
with really thoughtful students and faculty and staff who, who said, we want, it, we want this to be uh, um, addressed in a way that's, that's consistent with who we are at Rosemont, that we feel like we can add something constructive to it. Uh, and what I told them was, I don't want to do an event. I don't want to check a box or have a series of conversations. I want this to really become a part of our DNA. And, and to do that, I think you need to institutionalize it. And I think you institutionalize it in a couple of different ways. Um, I think you institutionalize it through our strategic plan and setting some goals around diversity uh, and belonging. And, and I, like, I like the term belonging um, even more than I like uh, maybe the traditional diversity and inclusion. I think diversity and belonging really fits the Rosemont uh, mission. And, and so I think you're going to see me institutionalize it. You're going to see the, the weight of the president's office behind setting these goals and, and working towards this across the different constituencies on campus. And, and I want Rosemont to, once again, not set back, but I want us to lean in. I want us to lead. I want us to be in the center of those productive discussions that are going to need to happen in our communities. And we have really thoughtful students and faculty who, who should be a part of that, that center. I just talked to a group of students today and I said, you know, one of my favorite parts of scripture is when, when Paul writes to Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because of your age. I said, you guys have something to contribute here um, and your thoughts matter. Um, and in pulling everything you get from your Rosemont experience and bring that into these conversations are critical. I think for our communities to, to hear that perspective. So you're going to see me institutionalize that. I think you're going to, I, I began this conversation tonight talking about change. You're going to see some change. Um, and, and I think this is one area you're going to see it become a part of our institution, a part of our DNA, because it really can be a strength for us. And it can be a, a, a distinctive part of, of how we work forward. Um, so Thank you. So our final question before we turn it over to the to the floor is um, a question about the outlook for the School of Graduate and Professional Studies. I'm so excited about the School of Graduate and Professional Studies. So um, a couple institutions ago, I worked at a little Vermont college called Champlain College. And uh, I was actually over, I was the VP over Graduate and Professional Studies. They didn't have a dean over it. I was the VP over it. And we were able to grow it from 500 to 2,000 students. And we did that by really focusing on relationships. I always say partner or parish. Um, and I really believe that we have an opportunity with our graduate and professional studies and with our undergrad college, for that matter, to really leverage technology and find new ways to, to extend the power of small. And I, I am going to be working with them uh, to to expand how and who we reach um, and, and to really think about our programs, think about our offerings. I, I mentioned that 1,200 seems to be the, the right number. And, and let me even get more granular than that. I think, I think we could be 12 to 1,500 in the next few years if we really focus on trying to build that campus community uh, in a way. Right now, we're about 50-50. Um, we have about, I would say, let's say 450 um, uh, 450 to 500 uh, graduate and professional studies, and we have about uh, 350 um, undergrad. And so that gets us into that eight to 900 range. I really think undergrad college needs to be about 500, um, and that, that graduate and professional studies could be anywhere from, from 750 to 1,000 students. Um, and and that, that would put us in a really nice place both financially and I think impact uh, across the country. And especially if you leverage technology, you have an opportunity to enrich your community. And, and I think I've told this story in different groups, but it's a story that impacted me. It was my last graduation at Cleary. And during graduation, I like to, I like to wander. In fact, they often have to, have to come find me when it's time for the march because I'm just wandering around talking to the students. And I wandered around and I met this young man he was from Mexico City. He was a business and, uh, information analyst. And um, he had went through our graduate program, never stepped foot in America, let alone our campus. And it was his first time. He lived in Mexico City, worked for a corporation we had a partnership with that had international sites. Took our program, graduated, 
brought his mother and was translating between me and his mother. And so we had that impact where we gained an alum uh, in Mexico City who was, who was a high level executive at this company. And having that kind of reach um, is where I see the, the, the opportunity for Rosemont College. Um, the education we offer, the power of small and the culture we bring to, to building meaningful lives. I think there's a hunger and thirst for that in corporations across the country. And, and we'll have an opportunity to really anchor ourselves into those corporations if we, if we do it in a very smart way, if we invest in, in how we leverage technology to deliver our education. And I think it brings an opportunity to grow this community in a way that maybe um, would have been unimaginable um, in the past. And so I'm really looking forward to graduating professional studies and I see it as a big opportunity to bring resources back to the college, but also to extend um, our family a little farther than, than, than where it's been extended before. Thank you. So the floor is open. Um, if you would like to ask a question, you may um, just raise your hand physically and I'll call on you to do that or you can use the raise hand feature in Zoom. Um, if you would prefer, you can also type your question into chat if that's easier for you. Um, but uh, really there is no question too big or too small. So feel free to share questions, comments. Kristen, I think there's a couple questions in the chat as well. Yes, I did notice that, yes. There is someone with a screen name of owner, and yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm... That's Mary McKenna Beck, class of 65. Thank you, Joe. Yes, it is, I'm sorry, I haven't changed that thing on my okay. screen. So my question was, uh, what are the characteristics of the students whom Rosemont can best serve? So I think that's a, that's a good question. And that's a question that, that I would like us to answer because every time I've asked that question, I haven't got one answer. I think it's been all over the place. And so when I talk about coming together in October, I really talk about us looking at our current students. I think we have conversations with a group of students who currently are here and saying, what, what has made this a good fit for you? I think we look at our, our graduate professional studies and look at the characteristics and the demographics I'm a big data person, and so I, I want Rosemont to become an organization that really leverages its data. I think we, we look at the student success of, of our populations and say, you know, was it a right fit? Did we provide the support services it, before they got here that they would need if we said, this is the student we want to accept, we should have the support services there to, to help them. So um, quite honestly, uh, I'm going in with an open mind, but we're going to look at a lot of data. We're going to pull demographic data. We're going to talk to students. We're going to talk to faculty. I do think that, that first-generation students are going to be a major target uh, of what we do, because I do think this is the type of college that can make a difference there. Uh, but, you know, I, I think as far as the type of students, I think we're going to look at our program and our majors and say, who are we attracting right now and why? Who are we retaining right now and why? Um, so I don't know that I could give you a, a tick list yet because that, that meeting's gonna, we're gonna really delve into the data in October, but um, I, I promise soon you're, you're gonna hear that we believe, we believe this is the strategy that will help us grow. And, and may I say, there, there, there's gonna be different avatars. So it's not just, here's the one student we're gonna go after. It is, here are the six profiles that really fit Rosemont. And, and you know, two of them may be graduate in professional studies and four of them may be undergraduate college, but, but we're gonna have distinct profiles and those profiles will lead us to channels uh, of enrollment. And, and that's where we'll start building our, our strategy. And I, I would use one more example. If we're going to school systems and we keep going to the school system and we're not getting students from them, or we're getting students and they're dropping out, then, then we have to ask the question, is that the right school system for us to be showing up at? Where we may have a school over here that we do really well, not only at attracting students, but retaining them. And why is that? What is it about the students who go to that school that allows us to be so successful with those students? And so it really becomes being curious about building that profile and, and understanding who we can best serve and that's really the question I'm looking to answer is how, who we can best serve. And there may be students we think we really want these students. And I think, I, I think again, 
diversity is our strength. And so we're going to look at, at continuing to diversify our student population as well as our leadership and the people who work here. But, but then we have to make sure that we're, we're creating space and support services to help with those diverse populations. Um, and before I build an international program at Cleary, the first question I asked was, okay, if we're going to have international students, what support services do we need to have to support them so they are successful when they get here? Um, because enrollment isn't just about getting them here. It's about them walking across that stage and, and shaking my hand and getting their degree. And, and that's where you know you've been successful. And by the way, that's where you become financially successful as well. Those, those two are interlinked and they cannot be separated. I hope that helps. Jason, there's a related question in the chat about uh, from Mary Beth. And uh, the question is, do we have the financial resources to provide the services that first generation students need? So I believe that, that we, have, um, we have services right now that support. I, I would hate to judge yet. I mean, uh, this is my first real semester with Rosemont and I think I'm doing a lot of observations. So I would hate to make a judgment this early. But what I will tell you is, if you begin to recruit those students, you have to, you have to prioritize that support services. So yeah, in other words, if you retain them, you're getting tuition every semester. So we could have a class of 300, but if you only retain um, a, a small percentage of those, then you're gonna actually earn less money off a class of 300 that you can earn off a class of 150 if you retain them at 80 or 90%. And so every dollar we invest in these support services, I, I promise you we'll be able to show a return on investment of two or three dollars that come back to us. And so it's building that economic model of understanding it's not how much you spend or what you spend, it's what is the return you're getting out of what you spend. And that, that becomes the, the shift in, in how you need to view things. Um, because it really is, it's not as simple as we don't have money for this, it is, we, we can't afford not to figure out a way to do this. And so we have to prioritize that over some other things because that's gonna help us bring resources back and, and help us live our mission. Um, so, so that's how we're gonna view it. Great, thank you. Looks like Marianne Schofield has a question. We will unmute you, Marianne. You may have to accept the prompt to be unmuted. Yes. There you go. Uh, can you be more specific about what these services are that you're providing? Yeah, I think so. So to dig into some some examples, um, you know, I would I would take for instance, if we have first generation students, there needs there's going to be. Uh, there's gonna be services that they're gonna uniquely need. Uh, so one of those examples would be, there may be uh, a need for services around creating workshops around study habits and, and scheduling yourself. And when I came into college the first time, I had no idea um, how to do um, good study habits because I was a first generation college student and, and high school came easy for me. And I got to college and it's a whole different level. So do we have, do we have a, a program around um, not only tutoring, but, but um, really scheduling their life, helping them learn you know, how to operate and organize their, their lives here? Do we have that, those student life services that help them stay connected? Um, do we have, you know, at some point, one of the things I've heard from professors is, is some students will come in and, and their, their comprehension will be great as far as reading. Some students, they haven't been exposed to mm -hmm. some higher level reading comprehension. And so if we're going to bring them in here, to me, when I bring a student in and when Rosemont brings a student in, it's an implied promise that goes two ways. If we've accepted you, it's not just sink or swim. It is we need to be committed to supporting you if we're going to accept you. And so as we build these profiles, we're going to see what are the common needs. I, I mean, mental health is a, is a common need right now among our students, not just with COVID, but beyond COVID. Um, and we may, we may have students who have increased mental health needs. We may have students who have increased physical needs. And, and what are we doing and what kind of services are we offering to, 
to, to provide them. We may have students who need transportation needs because they need to, tra to, to use transportation to, to go to um, their jobs outside of campus. I don't know what those needs are, but as we begin to build our class, I think, I think many of them will, will come in and some of them are in the classroom and about tutoring and helping them with study habits, but, but they're often some of them are outside of the classroom as well. Um, and, and that becomes something that if you, if you bring them in, well, I think we have a moral responsibility to offer those services. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what, just since I'm yakking, what's the percentage of day students versus boarders right now? Day students versus? Boarders. Those Resident in the dorm. Students. Oh, residents. Uh, so we have about 213 students in the residence halls right now. And we have about 350 in the undergraduate college. So mm -hmm. and we, had, we gave our students the opportunity that they could opt for online only. And we had about 20% of our population, of our, of, of our undergrad population, opt for online. Most of those who opt for online, who were going to be residential students, have asked that we reserve their room space for the spring. So my anticipation is we'll see in January that number go up. Um, but what I wanted to do, I, I will be honest with you, opening, opening the school was one of the toughest decisions I have ever had to face. Um, I, I, I was up early in the mornings. I was up late at nights um, uh, trying to make sure that, that I was thinking through every possible scenario. I took the the health and welfare of not only our students, but our staff and faculty, um, in, in a, it, it weighed on me, uh, to be honest. And I had some lengthy discussions with Mainline Health. Um, uh, and, uh, and so uh, I felt like it was the right thing to do, to tell our students, if you feel more comfortable staying at home, then I want you to stay at home. But we talk about those services, right? I also then brought in extra yes. students so we could help support them if they were going to opt to stay at home. And, um, and, and so we've, we've managed through that um, and that's where we are. Um, I hope that helps answer your mm -hmm. question. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. There is a question in the chat and I'll be glad to read it, but if anyone has a live question and wants to raise their hand, you're more than welcome. Marianne, are you uh, raising your hand there, Marianne Schiller? Oh, come on, Schiller. <laughs> I couldn't tell if it was just your thumb over the... Schiller, open your mouth. Come on. We have to unmute <laughs> just one second. And You'll have to accept the move? prompt. Here we go. Okay. There you go. I was enjoying the riffraff, so I, I figured let it go for a couple seconds. <laughs> Um, Jason, hi. Um, I I'm wondering how you're doing. How, do how was the move, all the adjustment? How how's it going for you? How do you like Philadelphia area? So thank you for asking. Um, so, you know, I, I think I, I'm not sure if I told this story. Um, I talked to so many groups, but uh, we did not see our, we had to, um, we had to online, we had to basically uh, secure a place to live. And so we, we ended up securing a rental because we wanted to get in the area and be able to look around and we couldn't because of, of the pandemic. But the first time we actually saw our place was when the, the movers were moving in furniture. Um, and fortunately, we, we love it. It's in a neighborhood that's very walkable um, and uh, uh, the layout's very nice. And we, we do like it. it's only about nine, 10 minutes from the college. Um, we have tried to get out every weekend and go hiking in different places. And we have, uh, tried to do takeout from a different restaurant every weekend. Uh, mm -hmm. but we yeah. have got to explore like we would normally. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I think overall the move has gone, uh, really well considering all the circumstances. My wife is already, um, has already joined the dragon boat team, uh, oh, good. Okay. On Google river and is paddling. Um, on what's called an OC, which is, which is an outrigger canoe. Um, uh, and uh, so she's enjoying that. And uh, we're just trying to, we're trying to have our rituals um, that we incorporate uh, while we wait for things to, to open up a little more. But thank you for asking. Well, continued good luck with that. 
Thank you so much. Schofield made me do that. Not the question. But <laughs> he made me do that. That's right. It looks like uh, Patty Doenrand has a question. And Marianne, I see you. We will, we will get to you next. Oh, no, not me. Oh, no, Marianne McGonigal. Oh, OK. Yes, but go ahead. Welcome to Rosemont, uh, President Boyers. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for you about the makeup of the faculty. So yes. many uh, smaller colleges have adjunct professors, and, and they come and they go through the years, maybe not even more than a semester or two. Part of the stability of the college is the full-time professors. Where do we stand now? Where would you like to see us be in terms of the faculty? You know, it's, it's a great question. So what, I've been meeting with the faculty, and so I have a series of, of conversations that I'm having with both full-time faculty and adjunct faculty. For the adjunct faculty, my question has been very simple, and it's been one question. Tell me about the adjunct experience at Rosemont. And, and it's been really illuminating about that. We have some, some adjuncts who have been teaching with us for many years, often longer than some of our, our um, <laughs> faculty. And uh, in fact, the other day I was on a, I was on a meeting with, with um, adjuncts and uh, uh, this gentleman told me he had been teaching here for 42 years. Oh my goodness. I, thought, I said, you were kidding me. I thought he was putting me on. Um, and uh, no, it's true, but um, I, I think you're right. Stability is, a, is a, our faculty are central. We'll never go any farther than our faculty bring us. And um, when I talked to the full-time faculty and I've talked with a number of different groups um, of full-time faculty, what I hear is that we're, they, we're spread a little thin. We have about 24 full-time faculty. We used to have close to 40. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I asked them, I said, so tell me, and you're a non-scientific, very anecdotal, gut level, um, you know, uh, way, tell me what you think is, is the right number. And they were very realistic. They said, you know, it's probably not 40, but it may be 30. Um, so maybe, you know, six, six more, seven more full-time faculty. And I said, okay, so that, that begins to give us a mark that we can, we can go towards. Um, and, you know, the other thing, I'll just I'll address the elephant in the room. Part of our challenge with faculty, um, I think we have some really good uh, young faculty. And I think we have some really seasoned faculty who are, um, who are uh, really great and, and have been here a long time and held a lot of institutional knowledge. Where we're weak is in the middle. And the reason we're weak in the middle is we have to, and this isn't new information for a small college, but we have to address our compensation. And this is one of those things where you have to prioritize and figure out how we can do it. And then you have to grow enrollment to help do it as well. But what happens is if you don't have compensation set right, and we're a little lower than some of our peer institutions, then what happens is you have that young group that never become a middle group. And you need that middle um, that have some institutional knowledge and some experience. But what happens is that young group gets some experience and then they move on. And they leave, yeah. And yeah. so we have to address the compensation in that middle. And I think we have to grow our faculty. I don't know if 30 is the right number, but I think, I think I have a faculty that will work with me to get to that right number. And it's gonna, it's gonna create some, some pressure on me and others to, to go out and get resources, to grow um, our enrollment online maybe even, uh, to, to bring resources back to college, to fundraise um, and, and bring money in. But, but again, I think we're not far off. The good news is we don't need 5,000 students. We need about you know 250 to 300 more students. And that's something we can do. Um, and, and so it's going to be go out, get our resources, um, fight for this college. The greatest gift you can be given is to have something that's worth fighting for. And every experience I've had at Rosemont says it's worth fighting for. Um, and, and, and my promise to you is I'm going to do everything I can to fight for this institution to make it stronger um, and, and to honor those who came before me. So, Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, 725. So Marianne, um, I know you have a question and depending on our timing, we may have time for just a final, a final question. But go ahead, Marianne. Have you had uh, any issue with security? And also what do you, how are you making the campus, keeping the campus safe for the future? 
So, so we, uh, we had this reopening task force that was so focused on COVID and now I've transformed it. We changed some members and we have what I call a health and safety task force that meets on a weekly basis. And I can tell you the information we got is we have not had any major health or safety issues right now to date. And uh, we, we built this task force and I brought in some new people and um, it really touches every part of the, the, the college. And the health and safety task force really um, addresses everything from mental health to, to incidents that happen on campus. Um, but, but overall, uh, we have not had any safety issues uh, here on campus that I would say are um, uh, uh, of note, I, I mean, uh, I think you know we've ha we've had some uh, some minor mischief with a, where a whiteboard fell or, or something, but uh, <laughs> maybe some noisy students <laughs> out of a window. Uh, but outside of that, um, it's been it's been pretty um, pretty calm. I think I think when you look towards the future, uh, one of the most important things uh, that you need to look at is is being being vested in the community and we live. Obviously, Rosemont's in a very nice area. Um, but we want to, we want our students to really be engaged with our, our greater community. And I think we're going to find ways to continue to bring our community into us and bring our students out to the community. And I think when you have those strong relationships, it makes everyone safer. Um, but I, we also, just from a logistical standpoint, we, we have revamped uh, compensation around um, our safety officers uh, because I, I, I felt um, in, in honest discussions with our with the head of safety, um, that we needed to to raise maybe our hourly rate to get a higher quality officer, and so we've done that. Um, so we're doing some of the logistical things there, but but overall, I've been very happy with how things have unfolded from a safety standpoint. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, is there a, a final question that anyone would like to pose? No pressure. No pressure. If not, I have a thought. Earlier today, um, Dr. Boyers was with a group of, of employees and he was asked the question about his impressions of uh, the alumni of, of Rosemont at this point in his uh, 100 days. And uh, as he mentioned, he's met nearly 400 plus this group tonight, many of you he's met previously, but um, I thought maybe um, you might want to share what you shared with that group about what you've learned from alumni so far. So, you know, I, I think what I told them was that it really was my interactions with the alumni that have strengthened my confidence in the future, that, that there's this greater community of Rosemont that, that these students in, in, in our community stay connected with, that, that alumni have, have a, a deep uh, commitment and in, in this, this burning inside of them that says Rosemont was was an important part of them building meaningful lives. And I, I brought up the idea that we have this mentor program and we have a waiting list to mentor our freshman students. And I said, that, that alone shows you um, that you're not, the, the power of small is you're, it's not just about the students there now, it's about this wider um, community that those students are, are linked to. And um, that's one of the things that have been an encouragement to, to me. I, I, I've gotten people who said, you know, um, that they feel bad to, because of the pandemic and, and starting out. And I remind them that the pandemic isn't happening to me. It's happening kind of to us. It's happening to all of us. And it's an opportunity for us to, to really focus on what's important. And I think my experience with alumni has been that, that all of you not only have been an encouragement to me, but that you're critical um, to, to our students um, being successful. And, and I appreciate, you know, uh, all of you showing up tonight um, in, in an evening where, where I'm sure there were competing priorities and, and being willing to have a discussion um, with me about, about the first hundred days and about looking forward. So I'm grateful uh, to this community and I, I, look for, for, I look forward to ways to, to keep you guys connected. Um, and I do look forward to to that vaccine, that therapeutic. I mean, we are going to have have to have such a party on campus when when we get this vaccine and get you guys all here. Um, I'm anxious for you to come back to campus and uh, get to meet you um, 
as I've told many groups, I'm, I'm taller in person than I am on Zoom. So, so I'm looking forward to meeting all of you. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm just grateful for this alumni community. I know you've been uh, a, a um, I know you've been a positive force for those in the past. I see Sharon here. I know Sister Jean. Uh, I'm glad to see, I see only a green screen, but I have faith that Sister Jean is there. Um, and, uh, and so um, I, I'm really encouraged about having this kind of alum, alumni support. Um, not every school can claim that. And, and I think it says a lot about what Rosemont has meant. And I, I know probably, like I said, Sister Jean and Sharon would agree with me on that. So anything else? Now, I'm, I'm telling you, you've got the president on the hot seat. So anything else I can answer for you? Is everybody getting my Monday emails? Do you like my Monday? Do, all right, good. Open those up. We love those open rights. Um, so thank you all for giving me some time tonight. And uh, God bless you. Stay safe. Uh, and uh, I look forward to more conversations like this.